Happy Friday. <laughs> I'm Megan Carney. I'm a tech writer at Google. And I'm going to give a talk today about web.dev. This is a project that's near and dear to my heart because I've been there from the idea stage through to the beta, and I'm hopefully going to see it through for another few years. So I did something I've never done before. I don't give a lot of talks, but when I normally give a talk, I'm really nervous about saying all the wrong things. So as a writer, I script everything out, and I say every single word exactly as it's written. And I went to a coach, actually, preparing for this talk. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do that today because I actually really care about this project a huge amount. And also, there's people in the room I know really well. And I want to just be myself, and I want to be comfortable. And the coach was like, hey, stop having speaker notes. <laughs> try it. Like, actually try and have a conversation with the room and tell them about the thing you built. So I'm actually going to do that for the first time. I do have a little bit of notes, but they're complete gibberish. So we're just going to have a conversation as if you and I know each other, and I'm going to tell you about this thing that I'm really excited about. So the agenda is really simple. I built this project with a team, and I want to tell you about our intentions, what we really wanted to do when we set out to build the project. Then I'm going to be super genuine honest about what we actually built for the beta, which launched at the Chrome Dev Summit in November. I'm going to show mocks alongside the pages, so you can see a real comparison before and after. And then I'm going to finish off the talk with the most exciting part for me, which is our aspirations, the things that we want to do next. And I can honestly tell you I'm really excited about this because it's the first time in Google where somebody actually treated learning for developers in my space as a product. And they're like, hey, we want you to build the right thing, so take your time and figure out what's the right thing to do. So let's start with intentions. I genuinely felt at the beginning of the web dev project a lot like Dorothy with ruby slippers, except I mostly wear sneakers, jeans, and t-shirts. I don't even own heels. <laughs> I'm really a simple person. But this was the first time where people were encouraging me to have really tough conversations and to start to try and figure out what we could do better to help developers succeed. And at the first, I was really nervous. I just talked to people on my team who I knew really well and asked them the hard questions. But after a while, I realized, whoa, these guys are super smart. So I started to write down what they were saying. And then when I would start to meet other people, I could show the things that the really smart people said to the other smart people. And it was like, oh. And then the idea would grow and grow and grow. And I would sort of amalgamate it into something a bit more sane. So this idea, web.dev, started with some really honest questions with people who work on the Chrome team. And I thought that I would share some of the early notes, the literal quotes that I wrote down from those early conversations that meant a lot to me and started to set the stage for the product. So <laughs> does anyone here know Eric Beidelman? I've been working with Eric for a really long time, and he's actually one of the most engineer amazing engineers I've ever worked with. And he's also one of the people when I was studying, my TAs are here today in the house, <laughs> I don't know if Zach's here. When I was studying, Eric actually taught me a lot about how to write better code. And he sat with me a long, a long time and was really patient with me. And so one of the things I, I asked Eric was like, what do you think is wrong with the stuff that I'm writing to help developers succeed? <laughs> I mean, we're writing, but I was writing a lot of it. And he said that uh, right now, developers wind up having to read thousands and thousands of docs in many different places to try and figure out how to solve a problem. And it's really tough for developers to get shit done. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty true. I had that experience when I was studying, and I know exactly what that feels like. So Ilya, I don't know if people know Ilya in this room. He's, he's more on, on the internal side of things, but one of the things about Ilya is he is very data-driven. Ilya is incredibly focused on analytics. So whatever he does, he's measuring to make sure he's having the correct and intended impact. He's also a really approachable person. So he was one of the people I sat down with early. And I was like, Ilya, <laughs> you wrote the original performance stocks that get the most page views. They're, they're the things everybody looks at to understand the concept of performance. Like, do you think those stocks are working? He was like, no. <laughs> and he just looked me in the eyes and he says, well, and he took a breath and he's really calm and kind of quiet demeanor. And he said, you know, they're good docs because they are written in a way to explain the concepts, the basics, the things that are important. But in all reality, our partners cannot actually use them at all to solve their problems. So I was like, okay, well, what are we doing then, right? And he's like, well, my recent job is to literally go to partners, go to content management systems, go to frameworks and be like, 
this is how it needs to be done, so let's rewrite everything so that developers don't have to worry about it or read docs and it'll just work. It's like, okay, that's cool, that's making docs meaningless, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's good, I think it's good to have less words. So Paul Kalin is my manager and he is a man of little words, but whatever he does say, he says really straightforward way and it pretty much is the truth and you can't put it in any, any other way other than the way Paul puts it, which is like really straight up, Web developers need to be able to solve hard problems in a simpler way. We need, to, we need simpler solutions to hard problems. So, you know, he's my manager. He's like, you need to find those simpler solutions and tell them what the developers what they are. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't think I can do that, but okay. So Deanna is the director of our group inside of Chrome. And we had seen some serious success. I don't know, do you guys, most people in here use Chrome DevTools, I think, right? I don't know if you've noticed inside the DevTools, there's like a link now to uh, Chrome release notes, then you get to watch the video of actually how to use DevTools, which is really handy because it's hard to understand the UI. Well, the person who does those release notes and videos is Case, and he's on my team. And the analytics for those links have been phenomenal. And so Dion has been looking at that and he's like, look, it's clear that developers like to try and figure things out when they're actually in a tool that's helping them figure things out. So if we have any tools that relate to the problems that we want developers to solve or help developers solve, we need to directly link in the act of solving the problem to content. Okay, I get that. Okay, that's, that's, and that makes a whole lot of sense. So, more and more conversations started to happen amongst our group with me in the room, with me not in the room. People were starting to feel like they could be a bit more honest. And it started to sort of get this feeling that we were all kind of in agreement that despite all the content we were publishing, despite a lot of talks that we were giving, and some of these talks and docs get massive amounts of analytics, right? It's like crazy amounts of analytics. It just feels like the progress toward a better web isn't going fast enough. Like it's still really kind of slow. It's hard to get momentum. It's hard to convince people to do the right thing. I don't even think it's convincing. I think people are just so bombarded with over information that they just, they're just like, how do I trust you? How do I know this is the thing that is the right thing to do? So <clears throat> I talked to Adi Osmani. Uh, I, do people in the room know who Addy is? <laughs> I really work with some really amazing people. <laughs> and one of the things about Addy is he's actually a, um, a, a kind of person who tries to connect the dots between people and help people form relationships to solve some of the, the problems in a more horizontal way. So he's always thinking, and you have to be listening. He's also a litmus test. So I didn't go to Addy right away. I waited until my idea was a little more baked. And then I went to Addy and I was thinking, if Addy gives me the kind of like, look like that, I'm like, oh, I gotta go back to the drawing board. But if Addy gives me something like, yeah, I can work with that, then I know I'm headed in the right direction. So I talked to Addy and he said, you know, there's groups of us working on these strategic initiatives. Addy owns speed. And we've been doing all kinds of cool things to try and improve the metrics on these initiatives. Maybe we could join up learning for developers in those initiatives more officially and try and come up with some sort of hybrid you know, solution that wasn't so, here's what we're doing and here's what you're doing and we don't really talk to each other that much except in the aftermath. Okay, well, okay, that's good. And then he said, oh, yeah, and you should really talk to Rob Dotson. I was like, oh, all right, I love Rob. He's a great guy. I never worked with Rob Dotson, but he is incredible. If anyone knows who Rob is, he's incredibly passionate about fixing the accessibility problem on the web. He's incredibly passionate about that. And he was giving like hundreds of talks and traveling all over the world, building multiple websites, <laughs> writing hundreds, you know, lots of talks. You can't even imagine this person. I don't know if he really sleeps that much. He really works very hard and tirelessly to make the web accessible and to make it accessible for developers as well. And Addy told me that Rob had this realization that all the stuff he was doing felt like he was just riding around in a wheel like a mouse and not actually having the impact he intended. So Addy says to me, Rob's created this two-year vision to actually combine API work, standards work, library work, talk work, doc work, all the kinds of things that will go into solving this problem into one very logical, measurable vision. And it sounds like you two should sync up because maybe you can learn from him. So I set up a 30-minute talk with Rob <laughs> to get a feeling for what he was doing. And it turned into an entire day. 
Like the whole day, Rob and I, we were in this, strangely enough, I, I like never used this room before, but it was just whiteboards all around. And he's like, let's just start writing stuff down. So we spent a whole day writing down every single frustration that we had and all the things that we really cared about that no one seemed to really be listening to. <laughs> and it was so cathartic. It was really, really pleasant. So we kind of looked at each other the other day and they're like, you want to meet tomorrow? I was like, yeah, let's meet tomorrow. We cleared our calendars, and the next day, we spent the entire day actually thinking of solutions, problem solutions, problem solutions. What are things we can do now? What can we do a little later? What can we do really far into the future? And we went home that night, and I think both of us knew something had happened, which is we had formed a partnership. And I don't know if anyone here has formed a partnership before. I've had it happen a couple times in my life, including my, my marriage. Um, but it's just the most amazing thing when somebody compliments you, when they have the same values that you have, but they approach life and solve problems in almost completely the opposite way. So where I'm this idealist and I love people and I'll form relationships and I'll think about the craziest possible thing you can think about, Rob's like, oh, slow down. What's the first step? You don't have a first step? We're not going to take a step. Do you have a comparison? Is there something out there that's realistic? Let's ground this amazing idea you're having into something that we can actually build. And so we came up with what we consider our first problem statement. And I'll tell you, it's wordy, <laughs> but it's the first try, right? And I think all of us have felt this before, which is that the increasing complexity of building for the web has made it super difficult for developers to map advice in our docs, and maybe in others as well, to real world applications. Right? That's, that's just happening. So now Rob and I are going out, and we're talking to everybody together, separate, and people are starting to kind of listen to us a little bit. And they're starting to give us some advice, and they're starting to help us develop a plan. And these are some of the things we started to unfold. Right? So existing guidance, it's really conceptual. Sometimes it's unclear. And tooling is all over the place. <laughs> and the docs and the tooling, they don't seem to talk to each other that much, unless it's a doc explaining the tool. Right? There's no way, at least I still don't know a way, even when I'm trying to figure out a way, of measuring if what we're doing, the, the learning that we're trying to give to developers, is actually helping them accomplish our goals. Page views. I've been looking at page views for seven years in Google. It's like, use data. I've been looking at page views. And it's like the web's still getting slower. So clearly, <laughs> like my page views are going up and the web's getting slower. So those two things make me feel like page views don't really matter, right? Documentation usually comes in forms of non-prescriptive walls of text. Right? We all are familiar with this. And so the trend, which is really cool, is we're all moving toward like, Code editors, like web-based code editors, web-based experiences where I'm just playing with the code. I don't really want to see any words. And if you have any words, please make them brief, right? Just show me the code. And uh, we've been doing all this conceptual content as the experts in X field, and it's just been word after word after word. And that, that's just not cool, right? I think people are sort of tuning it out. So this one's a little harder to unpack, but I really want to try and make this clear to everyone because it can come off the wrong way. And I want to make sure you understand what way I intend it. So there's a lot of learning platforms that tell developers how to build X, how to build a website, how to build a website with X, how to build a blank kind of app, how to build this kind of thing inside your app, right? Very few documents will tell you how to build them well. The interesting thing is we set out a task for us when we started publishing Web Fundamentals to actually provide best practices for building modern web applications that work across all devices, right? That was our, our thing that we were going to do. So we kind of, in all honesty, I think put ourselves a little bit up here in this universe of like, these are the right things to do. Do like me. Look how great this is. Look how easy this is. But we weren't actually doing things in a kind of practical way, like in a sort of like, I'm building this really difficult thing. I need to finish building it. And as part of that, I want you to tell me the easiest way to build the thing I'm building, and I want it to be good without me having to worry about it, right? So more focus on the building of the thing, not on the doing something well. So what we want to actually do is actually take some of that expertise and apply it to the universe of the developer, rather than expecting the developer to come into our universe, right? So this is something that's really important, and I think it'll start to play out a little bit more in the talk. 
So as we started to kind of talk to people and go through all our crazy ideas, we actually gathered a little bit of a group, right? And, and the way it sort of worked, which is really interesting about the web.dev team, is we'd meet people. People wanted to meet us for 30 minutes and tell us what they didn't like about things or what they did like about things. And then at the end, Rob and I'd be like, hey, do you want to help? Like, do you straight up want to help? Like, what do you want to do? What do you want to own? And they're like, well, yeah, maybe I'll help. You know, I might help later. Come back to me. But anytime someone was in that room and said, yeah, I totally want to help. And we were like, well, what do you want to own? I'm good at this. It was like, that's yours. <laughs> Yours, you own that, that's your thing. If that's what you want to do, define that role, you own it. And so there was a lot of give and take in the relationships we formed on the team because we actually just wanted to do the right thing. And I don't think anyone who joined the team was as hung up about what their role was and what they were going to actually, I guess, be officially claiming that they were doing, if that makes sense. So we had a team. And I almost pulled this slide out because it's kind of overwhelming. But it's important to me that people see this. In fact, Hussein is here, and he was a huge part of, he actually wrote most of the content <laughs> in the beta launch, right? And he was a huge part of helping us understand how to write it better and being really open and willing to iterating on it. And every person on this list was an equal partner in trying to do something better and trying to build something different. And I, I'm not going to tell you a story about all of them, but the icons mean something. So if anyone has some curiosity about what the icons mean, I would be happy to explain them to you after this talk. Or in the Q&A, you might ask me about them. That's fine. So all of us as a team came up with a little bit better of a solution. It's still really wordy, but we now have bolded things that matter the most. And we have a thing. We have a thing called web dev. So web dev is going to connect our actionable guidance and integrated tooling with users' specific frameworks and libraries, giving a, a more cohesive, prescriptive set of content to help developers be successful. And we're going to unpack a bit of that as we, as we talk through uh, the reflection period of the project and also into the aspiration period. But this is something that, if you remember some of the quotes that I, I share with you guys, you'll see some things that we're really pushing against. Like, instead of being conceptual, and non-descriptive, we're going to be as descriptive as possible. And instead of having guidance that is not necessarily realistic, we're going to be as realistic as possible. And the thing that's maybe not revealed here is we actually want to connect the things that we can assess about a developer's website with their learning opportunities in the most personal way. So you get your own set of docs that matter to you, not docs that are used by every single person. Okay, well let's talk a little bit about that value proposition. And I actually took <laughs> the next couple of slides out of our uh, PRD, and I, and I feel like it's okay to do that because it's as clear and truthful as possible because you can actually see the content that was in our PRD. Uh, project, I don't know, what is a PRD? Does anyone know? <laughs> is it reference doc or requirement doc? Maybe requirement doc, yeah, Pro project re product requirement doc. Yeah, okay, so we d I just call it a PRD. I don't know what half the acronyms are in Google. There's so many acronyms. There's even the same acronym used in multiple cases, so you just go, all right, PRD. So we knew that the, the most important thing that we wanted to do was to integrate things that would help developers succeed with the tools that developers were using. We knew that was something we really wanted to do. And we wanted to be able to quantify that when developers assess something and then we help, try to tell them how to fix that thing, we could actually monitor whether or not that advice we were giving them was helping. Right? And this is something we really thought about a lot. We also thought about this idea of like, OK, we're going to have these tools and then we're going to have this guidance. And we don't want the guidance to be sort of off to the side that you just click to read if you want to click a blue link. We actually want to create, make that guidance a bridge between the tool that the developer is using and the developer's site. So instead of it just being words that you might read or not read, we actually want it to be part of the tool, a bridge from your site to the tools and back again. We also want to introduce monitoring, right? So it's not, I don't know, have people here use Lighthouse? Because that's one of the main things that's baked into the site. 
So Lighthouse, right, you run Lighthouse, audits your site, it gives you some, some metrics on how healthy your site is, yeah? Well, one of the things we did with web.dev is we actually made it possible to store a URL with your name, and you can come back and see over time how your score has changed. So we're running Lighthouse against that URL that you're storing over a period of time and reflecting the changes in, in, in the scores. And this is something that we want to do a lot more with because in the beta, we didn't actually really get a chance to, to get it to where we want it to be. But we're actually pretty excited about this idea of monitoring the health rather than just like checking the health oneself. And finally, um, this one, Hussein is going to be in our question and answer sessions. And he's just become the lead on this. <laughs> so um, I'm super excited he's here. But we are going to actually start to enable better personalization through identification of your development stack, including third-party or content management system, third-party libraries and frameworks. And that means we can actually give you guidance that's directly related to what you're building with. Yeah? So the second part, which dives a bit more into that personalization, we want to actually provide a happy path for popular frameworks and tool chains. So this can be a little controversial, so if you want to ask questions about this, totally can, right? We made a decision that we are going to help developers build the healthiest websites they can in the frameworks that most people are building in. So that, that is not necessarily, in fact, it's most likely not going to be a Google product, right? And that's okay. And we had uh, many, many conversations around, oh my gosh, like we might get this particular content management system upset, we might get this framework upset. And we're like, no, actually, we just need to do what is best for the developers, and we'll constantly be aware of when things are changing, when something's becoming more popular, if something is taking traction, we'll try and, 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 and go where you want to go, rather than trying to force you to go somewhere that you're, you're not actually headed toward at all. We also want to start catering toward interest in businesses. So if you're building an e-commerce app, we want to show you how to make your e-commerce app fast. We don't want to show you how to make your cat app fast. We literally want to move towards showing you how to make your e-commerce app fast. And then finally, the fourth point is we really want to move, a move toward a more two-way conversation, a bit like this talk, <laughs> hopefully, except you're not really talking back at me that much yet, yet. Um, but we want to give chance for developers to contribute in all kinds of way ways like some cool feedback ideas that we have where you don't just give us feedback, we actually tell you what other feedback is at the act of giving feedback. We give you percentages as well of feedback that we're getting so you get to see some of our analytics and engage with that, which we're pretty excited about. We're also working toward localization and uh, a simple way for people to actually contribute content that's like super straightforward blog style. So that is kind of our first sort of look at our value proposition. Our MVP was pretty simple. Um, I, I think it's worth saying we had 10 weeks from the beginning of the project to launch at Chrome Dev Summit to, to build this thing. So we tried to keep it pretty narrow. And the two things we scoped was the profile page, where we're going to have user login. We're going to allow people to have URLs stored. And we were going to use Lighthouse against those URLs over time. And the second thing that we were going to do is create content that was organized around those Lighthouse metrics that would map to the same principles. So you'd run Lighthouse, you'd get a speed score, and then we could link you to some really cool solutions to some of the problems in your performance. So that was our MVP. OK, deep breath. <laughs> We're moving to the next part. The coach was like, take breaths, slow down, talk to your audience. I'm like, OK. Am I talking too fast? We're doing okay. MVP is most valuable player. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> minimum viable product. Right, it's another acronym. That's terrible of me as a writer to like fall into the acronym trap, right? Yeah. So when I say minimum, I mean like super tiny minimum viable product. Right? Okay. Reflections. So this is a chance for us to take a little bit of a look at what we actually built. So, <laughs> does everyone know the scene? This is one of my favorite scenes in all of movie cinema history. I just need to watch it. <laughs> and if you haven't seen it before, this is the first time every single person on this planet saw color in a movie. And in a way, that's kind of how I felt with the web.dev project. 
This was the first time I got a chance to build a product with a team. Norm, I built a lot of websites or played a role in building websites, but they've all been static, right? And none of them have had signed in users or data. So this was the first time I was managing a project, a co-managing project with Rob, where we were going to sign in users, we were going to store some data that they agreed to have us store, and we were going to do stuff with that data. And that kind of changes the game. It, I mean, it doesn't kind of. It completely changes the game, right? And I think it's worth mentioning, like, we knew we had to scale, right? We knew we were going to have to scale to, like, millions of people and, like, on the first day because we were going to get Reddit and we were going to get Hacker News and there was going to be a lot of people who were like, what is this thing, right? And we didn't want it to be broken the very first day. And we also had to deal with privacy and security and something that is near and dear to my heart, like, don't be Google creeping people out. Right? Like, please, let's not creep, creep people out with the data that we're storing. So, you know, this was a real eye opener for all of us, and it was a 10 week cycle. And I just want to tell you all I have a huge amount of empathy for all that you do in production environments. So, I want to start a little bit, though, with some of the positives. So, we did something that, that we haven't done before in my career at Google, which is we treated content as a product, so not as a thing that you ship with a product, we treated it as a product itself, which is really exciting. And there's a lot of things that change when all of a sudden you have a product. And the first thing that happens is your experience moves away from static to interactive almost immediately. It's like, OK, we're not just going to have a page that people can process, so what are we going to do? So we formed a partnership with Glitch. Because a lot of us really liked their blog. It's a really cool community. I love that community. And we were actually using Glitch already in some of our tutorials because it allows you to actually write front and back end code, right? And you can actually see all the things that are happening in your one little thing. So like, oh, well, maybe we can talk to them. Maybe they'll want to like work with us. And they did. So that was something that happened. The other thing that happens is like words, they stop being an explanation. They stop being the thing that's explaining the product, and they start actually being part of the tool, which is super surreal. <laughs> like, you start to think, well, can the tool solve it, or do I need words? Oh, if the tool can solve it, let's take away the words and build it into the tool, and vice versa. Oh, well, maybe it's easier to write this and simplify the tool a little bit. And you start to play around with the boundaries between content and tools when you treat content like a product. The other thing that I found really fascinating is that there is an inclusion roadmap, a product inclusion roadmap that you can follow when you're building a real product, right? So I'd worked on, on making sure that my content was, was cool to most people on the planet, and that meant like being conscientious of some of the language I use, some of the pictures I use, and those things are really important. But it wasn't actually changing the demographic data in, in terms of who was using my content. It wasn't actually being intentional about making sure that all kinds of people building all different kinds of things were actually feeling included in what I was doing. And so we actually were able to use the, the Google product inclusion guidelines as well as the inclusion roadmap early on. And one of the things that came out of using that product inclusion roadmap was a lot of focus on the user and understanding who your user is, but who your user might be, who you might be leaving out. And I have to say this is the first time I've worked on a website in Google where I had a UX designer. <laughs> and the UX designer, we, I mean, I just, I can't even tell you. Like, it's like someone sitting there, like Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder going like, you need to do the right thing. And if you ever meet Hui, she would actually sort of say that with her head saying like, you really need to do the right thing, right? You need to do the right thing. And so she kind of led us through from very early on, making very positive decisions about what we wanted to do. And she also led us through some early qualitative design reviews with some people in the industry to get a feel of this was like totally useless, like, or something developers could actually use. And we had a whole series of usability testing, which was led by Jason Randolph, which was intentionally inclusive, which is like something I didn't even know existed. But like literally, we tried to get developers from all over the place, from all different walks of life, building all kinds of things with different experience levels, and have them walk through our product in its, in its prototype stage and give us genuine feedback on whether or not it was actually something they could work with. So it was, really, it was something really valuable. So I'm actually going to show you the mocks compared to the real pages. And this is actually really fun for me to make these slides because I haven't done that since the launch. I didn't go back to the mocks. So I was like, oh my gosh, 
they're not as far off as I thought. Um, so, okay, let's dive in a little bit. I'm not showing every page, I'm just showing three of the main pages. You can see on the left, uh, I don't know, the left. <laughs> Am I blocking the light? I'm probably blocking the light. They were like, stay away from the light, Megan. I was like, okay. Um, this is, on this side, is the mock profile page, and on the other side is the actual measure page that we uh, launched at our beta. And one thing I want to say is you can see something that's the same. So the thing that's the same, or kind of the same, is we're showing Lighthouse scores um, for a URL. And actually, on, on the mock page, there's multiple URLs. And then in the measure page, we're also showing scores over time, right? And you can see there's this list. And on the list, they're sort of like, hey, here's your opportunities. And if you do this, it's like going to increase your score by 17%. And you can see over here, we change that to like high. If you do this, this is really good. It's going to make your score better. So that is something we actually tried really hard to implement. We thought it was important to get that in the beta. It wasn't just us thinking that. That was actually part of our qualitative reviews. People in the industry were like, yes, developers will love this. Tell us what's wrong with our site, and then tell us exactly what we should fix first. So we're like, OK, well, we'll implement that. There are other things on here you can see we're exploring, which is like, how do we incentivize learning? So how do you keep track of what you're trying to do? Do we want to do some kind of badging? And when we got to the launch, we're like, let's just really start to integrate tools with advice and not get so caught up in, in, the, in the scoring and the learning yet. And I say yet because we're still exploring that, you know? And we may start A-B testing different versions of this to see what people like. But in our beta launch, this is kind of what we wound up with. Okay, so here's a mock guide. Actually, Hussein wrote this guide. <laughs> he wrote the early version and the later version. Um, so one of the things I want to call out here is that they're the exact same guide, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and what's, what's different is on the left side, you can see that there's this little you know, box with information. And that box is actually telling you, hey, if you actually do what you're being, what's being in, shared with you in this guide, you're going to increase your performance by 7%. It's also telling you kind of where you are in the whole series of things to learn how to make your performance better. It's giving you the languages and tools that it's covering. It's giving you browser support and all kinds of signposts which I think I mentioned earlier, like we really want to start signposting content and helping you make sure that you're in the right content that's best for you, right? And when we launched, we wound up not having time to do that. So when we get to aspirations, that will come up again. So what we did wind up doing, which is actually in both of these <coughs> guides, the prototype and the launch, is we set some really strict guidelines for our guides. And one of those was a word count. So every guide, has to be under 1,200 words. You can use as much code and images and whatever you want, but you're only allowed this many words. So that was the thing that we set. And the thing is, I don't know, if, has anybody here tried to figure out code splitting before? Right? Code splitting is one of these things that usually takes a lot of words, right? It, it actually does take a lot of words. And when I first read all of our code splitting guides, I was like, I still have no idea how to code split anything. I really have no idea how to code split anything. And then Hussein wrote this guide, and it was like really short. And I was like, oh, I know how to code split stuff. And it took me like 10 minutes. And so I had that feeling where I, was, I, I just felt so satisfied in myself that I could learn this thing that before took me a long time, and I still didn't understand it. So that feels like a win to me. OK, this is the CoLab. And you can see we've integrated with Gletch, right? But we made some changes between the prototype and the beta. So one of the things um, that came out of the usability testing is that developers really wanted to see the thing that they were working on while they were working on the code, right? Because everybody's used to that, right? So we're like, oh, but it's kind of gross. Like, you've got all this stuff going on. But the feedback came back, and it was like, we want to see what we're building as we're building it, right? And so now what you get is this experience where you're following along this kind of tutorial, interactive tutorial. You've got the code right there that you can work on, and then you can see it. And the cool thing about Glitch, and I don't know if people have used Glitch, is you can actually like upload this to GitHub when you're finished. It's yours. It's also your own Glitch, so you own it. So when you finish it, it's kind of your own little project, right? So we're kind of excited about this. And, uh, it seemed like it was going to be this big hit. We were really, really stoked. So I'm going to talk a little bit about lessons learned. And I think 
The first lesson, which I touched upon at the start of this, is that production sites with real users are exponentially more complicated than static sites. And I'm glad we experienced that because I don't think I could possibly have any more empathy for all of you in this room right now having had to actually go through security and privacy re reviews for real. This one's really important to me because I've been talking a lot about the team. Like I'm, I'm co-leading this project. We have a lot of people coming to the team and we have a little bit of a reputation, right? And I wanna kinda unfold this a little bit in that you know, moving fast is both good and bad, right? We had a very short window to build something that we cared about a lot and we were trying to do things we hadn't done before. And we moved really fast. So we built something. And in the act of moving fast, nobody had time to hold on to anything. Nobody had time to obsess over whether something was right or wrong and debate it a million miles a minute. If someone had a decent idea that was better than the previous one, we took that idea. So we evolved together. The other thing is it's a really good way when you move fast to build teams, right? If you have a team of people who are starting together and everybody's got something they really care about and you, you're having to move fast, you form this really interesting symbiotic relationship that I don't think will ever go away. All the people who went through this with me, I now consider friends. <laughs> like I really trust them and I know I can go to them if something has, is going wrong. But there's also some bad things about it. And one of the bad things about it is like when we were going through this experience and we were trying to build this thing and people wanted to help. They're like, oh, you're on fire. Like literally our project was kind of on fire and they're like, well, let me come in and help you. And we're like, sure, jump on this plane that's like up in the air <laughs> and get in and help. And people are like, this, is, this isn't cool, right? Like I don't really want to risk my life in order to give you some help. And we hadn't really worked out a way to expand and grow the team that was positive because we were, we were moving so fast. And so we'll talk a little bit in the aspirations about this some more, but we have definitely spent a lot of time about not stopping the work that we're doing, but being a lot more pragmatic about the choices that we make, taking a deep breath, seeing our kids, petting our dogs, doing our exercise, eating normal food, like we're all trying to be sane from now on out, right? Because that's important. Oh, this one is really true. Success metrics for developers are really challenging to define. Even when you have a tool like Lighthouse, which I'm hoping some of you have used in the room, the metrics kind of change with all kinds of weird things blowing in the wind, right? Getting metrics right is incredibly difficult. But I really genuinely feel that it's worth trying. Because if this is the one way where we can sort of say to developers, hey, it's not us, it's not our opinion, it's this, this tool that we built that's just assessing what's there, and you know, believe it or not, but it, it seems to be relatively consistent, and it's at least some kind of guidance that's impartial. And this is my final one, which is really near and dear to my heart, which is that diverse and inclusive teams are better teams. I really care about product inclusion a lot, um, I was the only woman on my team for a really long time, um, and I am the only female lead on our team. Um, I, I always feel like there's this sort of interesting perspective that I, I've gotten from being in that position. So when I started this project, and Rob and I started this project together, we were really intentional about trying to be open to building a different kind of team. And I can tell you right now, the best metaphor I can give you for why diverse and inclusive teams work is it's kind of like a startup, which is really weird, but it has a startup culture when you have all different kinds of people who fulfill different roles, except it's a startup who actually have sensibility and direction. So it's like take away the bad parts of a startup and keep the good parts of the star startup, and that's what a diverse and inclusive team is like, right? <clears throat> so. Coming to the last part, which is my favorite part, which is like what we really want to do, but we just didn't have enough time. <laughs> and we're hoping to really start to unfold some of this as we move forward. And there's us. <laughs> this is, and it literally is us, because I'm, I'm still not sure exactly how we're going to get there, and if we get there, if it's going to be what we expect it. But, you know, we're going to try. So <clears throat> I want to unfold some of the problems that we've analyzed looking at analytics and feedback after the launch. And the first problem I want to look at is that developers are not using the to-do list. So you remember in the mocks, I showed you that was the thing all the people wanted us to have was run Lighthouse over time, create this really cool to-do list with high priorities, and developers will love that. <coughs> they're not using it. 
So we're like, oh God, do we need to make it scream, light up, explode, call it out? And we might need to do that a little better, like fix the UI, make it a lot clearer about what the heck that list is, have some time, you know, get get we back in and a few other UX people to actually make it more comprehensive. And that's that is possibly something that we might do. But we're also trying to look at the solution in a different way. One of the things the analytics have has revealed to us is we are getting an enormous amount of URLs stored. So a lot of people are going to our site and entering URLs, and they don't mind running the test, and they don't mind saving it to themselves. They're not afraid, which is something we were paranoid about. We have hundreds of thousands of URLs, right? So that seems to be a positive signal, right? On the flip side of that, everybody is immediately going from the results into the Lighthouse report. So like, oh, yay, it's just like Lighthouse, but it's much easier. And then click, let me see the report, right? And then they're gone. So we're like, okay, well, if we're sticking to our whole ethos, which is don't force the developers to come to where we are, but go to where the developers are, then we need to provide that personalized guidance from the, from the report, right? So you're in the report, you go to the report, okay, so how can we guide you to do the right thing from there? So unfold the solution, again, a lot of words, but I feel like it's important to have them written down so you can kind of visual, visualize it, and also it kind of puts me on the hook, right? but I wanted to give you a real sense of how we think we should solve this problem. And basically, you can go to your Lighthouse report from anywhere you run Lighthouse. You don't even have to be in web.dev, right? Because, like, choose your own path. But when you go to the report, currently, if you click on one of the links to the guides, that's kind of your old school, conceptual, this audit fails, maybe, if you do this, and you might be able to fix this if you do this, or follow these other 10 links on some suggestions how to fix it, right? It's very much along the lines of our traditional, conceptual, not personalized learning. Now what we want to do is actually be like from the report, okay, click on this, and you're going to go into this guide, and it's going to be like, oh, you failed this audit. This is why you failed it, so just expose the opportunities that we've gotten from your actual code, and then here's how you fix it. And eventually, we might even be able to tell you how to fix it based on your content management system, your tool chain, your framework of choice. So we will actually give you the solution closer and closer and closer to the thing that you actually are trying to debug. Our goal here is to literally give you the answer, but that's something that we're going to have to work toward over time. And then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to build the narrative around the audits. And we're actually going to show you kind of your overall score within the, within the narrative in an audit. And the reason why we're doing this isn't just because, like, hey, well, you've got to group them somehow. It's because one of the things we realize is the act, which sounds really stupid now that I'm saying it, like it should have been like, duh, super obvious, but the act of optimizing a site that you've already built and monitoring it over time is really different than learning something new. There are very different acts. And so we need to be very intentional about helping you debug and optimize and monitor, which is different than, hey, let's, let's actually help you build something really cool. Okay, so now this was the other thing we started to look at and, and really give ourselves a little bit of, of, of an honest wake-up call. We organize our content, I think you can remember, based on the principles that are roughly aligned with the lighthouse categories. A little bit off, but, but as close as we could get them. And we noticed that developers aren't stepping through the principles. So most of the people who are coming to our guides are coming through organic search, or quite frankly, they're coming from Addy's tweets. Addy's tweeting, hey, check out this guide. <laughs> we get like 100,000 people from his tweets going to that guide. And with the exception of the optimized image docs, nobody is, is actually going from guide to guide to guide. Right? They're going to the guide that they link to through search to solve a particular problem or that Addy kind of said, gave a shout out to, and they're just not stepping through it. For some reason, they are stepping through the image content, maybe because it seems more straightforward and they have time to do it within five or 10 minutes because it is easier to optimize images than to reduce JavaScript. But in general, that data point was important to us. So we really started to think about that. Okay, how are we going to solve this problem? And again, we could have done the traditional tech writing thing, which would have been like, let's make the content better. Let's make it more obvious that this is a narrative. Let's reward and badge people and do all this stuff because that's, that's going to make it much clearer that people are in a thing and they should step through it. But that's not what we're going to do. <laughs> we actually think that the solution here is to show you how to build real websites. 
And this is kind of fascinating because <laughs> I think what we, we sort of were like, everybody cares about speed, so they're going to want to go through all the speed. Well, no, we care about speed, right? That's our, in our OKRs and our perf, and we get rewarded if we make the web faster. That's not necessarily what your manager cares about when you're building a website, right? They want you to finish the website and bring it to production. So we're like, well, what we should do is help you build a website and then bake that principal content in so that as you're building something you're familiar with, you can see how you could do it better, right? So we need to go again to where you are and help guide you through some of those healthier choices rather than expecting you to understand what it is that we're trying to, to do with the, the overall web platform. And the other thing that's worth noting is we actually got some feedback from people who were kind of some qualitative feedback post-launch who are in the industry. And, they were, and we were really surprised because they were like, could you just, could somebody, could, could you just tell us how to build a website? And I got that feedback directly and I went and did a search. And has anyone ever done a search like how to build a website? And like tried to add things to it, like how to build a website. Um, if you do that search, it's really interesting. Even when you modify it, you probably will not get the answer that you expect. As far as I could tell, I could not find a reliable resource on like, oh, I have a page and I have a thing and I need to store my users on some database and I need a login and there's credentials and then I'm gonna have payments and somehow they're gonna be processed and then I'm gonna take a huge performance hit and all these things that happen that drive everybody crazy, none of that is being captured anywhere. That's sort of end to end. And that's something that I, I believe that we should spend more time on. So just continuing forward from that, we, we still wanna avoid walls of text we want to make sure that these how to build a website are fast and clean and interactive. Has anyone here done the Next.js tutorial? Oh, it's so good. It's so good. I did that tutorial and I was like, I like Next, but my God, I really like this tutorial. So we're really inspired by it and we want to do something similar, um, but, but to use it to, to kind of help people do some very simple things and to make sure that they're, they're keeping their, health, their, their website healthy. Um, I think we'll also follow Next's lead where we'll link all to docs. And what I really like about the Next tutorial is it, it doesn't link to just docs and Next. It links to docs all over the community. So if they're talking about React or they're talking about Webpack or whatever, it goes off there because that's where it should be, right? But we want to make sure that you can at least go through the end-to-end -end and understand the context of what you're building and how all this fits into that. So we're going to move a little bit from the vertical space into the horizontal. And then finally, um, we're actually going to try and keep the scope narrow. Like, this isn't like, oh, let's, let's build like 8,000 use cases and then you can just like pick whatever one you want. No, actually we're going to pick a really small subset um, of ones that we think matter in a given year, like things that people are really struggling with. And we're going to base the tutorials on those use cases. So it's possible, not probably, I don't know, we'll see. You might get like one a month, right? And this is, hey, this is the thing you might want to learn this month. I can tell you right now that we're starting at the moment investigating the first set of these use cases, and it's literally going to be like how to get started building a website. One version will be literally how to create your profile page, but with a little flair, and the other one will be more complex. It will have users. It will have data. It will have a framework. It will have all kinds of things that you need to do to your build stack to do the right thing. So we're going to try in our Get Started experience to cover a wide enough gamut to give people a pretty good idea of how to build websites if you're just a junior and starting off, or if you're pretty advanced and you just want to glance at what are the key things you need to know for this particular year. So yeah. And the last problem, um, we need to build a more inclusive product. And I do not have the solution to this. This is a really hard problem to solve. But I have some things that I think that we're gonna, we are working on some of these, and some things that I think we can put a little more work into. But I think we're going to continue to seek opportunities to personalize content and meet developers where they are. It's a recurring thing, right? We want to know what you're building and help you build it better. And that is, that is a really genuine thing. That is something that we're trying to do. We're going to start to localize our content, but do it in a way where the content is always up to date. And there's a really easy way where if you speak a particular language and the machine learning tool that we're using is terrible, you can jump in and fix the language so that it's better. We want to create a simple way for you all to actually contribute content. Like, I mean, like, super simple, click a button, send us a blog post, or maybe even just, like, click a button and we'll get your blog post. And we can start to share community knowledge a little bit more. And, and I think it's sort of 
a little bit like the HTML5 Rocks model, we want to bring a little bit of that back and allow people to, to also help teach best practices around these things. If, if you have a better way of doing it, we will actually consume that. Um, and then we want to build a two-way channel. I talked to you a little bit about this earlier. Um, I personally get really frustrated when feedback is like, hey, do you want to provide feedback? And you click the thing, and then it brings you into this big window, and then you have to like select the thing, and then, and then poof, it's gone. <laughs> you have no idea what happened, right? Um, so we want to create a feedback system where you can easily click something and then get, get actually a response, where it's like, oh, hey, you know, 10% of our users actually clicked the same response that you clicked, and here's what they said. Right? So just start to unfold certain crazy ideas around what, what kind of feedback we can share with each other about what we're trying to do. It, it, it's a little bit scary, that. So it's more in the sort of fantasy side of things, but it is something that we're thinking about. And then finally, we want to actually try and explore more groups that we're not actually helping to help them build uh, better websites. Uh, a really good example of this is during the launch, we got a lot of webmasters contacting us and being like, wow, this is a really cool site. I really like your discoverability section, but we have these other 10 problems. Can you help us? And that was the first time a webmaster was like, hey, yo, we're here. We're listening. You do not have enough information. So I think we want to try and repeat that pattern and, and seek out other groups that we can help. OK, <laughs> one final thing. <laughs> um, we need your help. Uh, it's a really small project that's just getting off the ground. And we think it can be cool. Um, but it's totally not going to be cool if it's just like a few of us in a room trying to, to do it. It's much better if the community is supportive and helps let us know how we can make it better or actually physically help us make it better. So I, I just put some links here to the typical like end of the talk, set of links. That's the link to the site. So check it out. Um, that's the link to GitHub issues. Um, you can submit a pull request. You can start a conversation. Uh, that's the Twitter handles for me and Rob. Rob is incredibly active on Twitter. He just got a new puppy. Her name is Bean. She is awesome. So even if you don't follow Rob now, you should follow him now. Um, I'm kind of active on it, but whenever Rob has a conversation, I always jump in because I want to see Bean the dog. And then we're also starting up a new hashtag. So feel free to, 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 to tweet to that. And finally, if you're here, you can ask me and Hussein live questions. Um, and you can come and talk to us in person. Um, that's, that's why I'm here, actually, is to actually be a human being and uh, have a conversation. So one final scene. <laughs> um, this is crazy, because when I was getting the coaching and I had this whole Wizard of Oz theme, the coach was like, wow, you know, you should end on, like, the last scene in the movie when it goes back to black and white. And I did not remember that. Like, I completely forgot that she goes home and the color changes. And I was like, God, oh, that is such a good way to end. Because I, I, I really feel like, will feel like web.dev is successful when people are able to go to it, find a simple happy path to building something they want to learn to build, or find a really simple way to monitor the health of their site and make it better. And it's a tool that people use that isn't complicated, that doesn't have a lot of hype, that isn't like some big thing that, I mean, like, I may never give a talk about it again, right? Like, I want it to be a safe, simple tool that people use. So in a way, I really just, I'm like Dorothy, man. <laughs> like, I just, I just want to be home and chilling with my kids and running and eating and like, no more crazy. So that's it. Thanks.